Hey, everybody. Welcome to TGIK 177. Uh, we are coming at you uh, on two fronts today. Uh, Josh, you've seen me in a couple TGIKs, and I've got Tim with me today as well. We're super Hello. psyched to be here. Um, Tim, you haven't hosted a TGIK before, is that right? Yeah, I've never been. hosted a TGIK before. I've been in 12,000 SIG meetings, but this is my first TGIK. Well, we are glad to have you. Welcome. Um, for those that don't know you, do you want to just give us kind of an intro on yourself? Yep. So I, I think, what was it? DockerCon 2014, when Kubernetes was first announced, uh, I was one of those people who were immediately on what was uh, IRC at the time, Google Containers IRC grilling this guy named uh, Joe Bita being like, does it do this? Does it do that? Does it do this? Does it do that? And his answer, his answer was like, no, yes, no, yes. Who is this guy? <laughs> uh, uh, so I've been in the Kubernetes community since like the first day, uh, day one. Uh, from that, I've been working in the Kubernetes community. I've had various roles in the community. Uh, I started out as the scalability lead because in the early days of Kubernetes, nothing scaled. Um, so it was like a whopping, you know, 50 nodes before it imploded. Uh, and then we moved on to other things over time. So I worked uh, in scheduling and then uh, SIG cluster lifecycle. I worked in the steering committee for a while. And uh, now I'm I'm leading up uh, T, uh, TKG and sort of the, the architecture of TCE and where we're, we're trying to go to and where we're trying to get to. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, um, feel free to say hey in chat. Um, it's kind of tradition around here to say where you're signing in from if you feel comfortable doing that. It's good to see some super familiar faces in chat. Uh, Martin, Rory, uh, Rico, Savi, uh, Eric. So great to see you all again. So we'll start off today as we usually do with just kind of an overview of what's going on. Now, um, as Tim can attest to, uh, we are very busy people this week, which means that we did not do a very good job of filling in things that are going on in Kubernetes. <laughs> so if anybody has anything they want to add to stuff they know that's going on in core or just the Kubernetes ecosystem, feel free to add those in and we can we can talk about them a bit. Tim, I know you've been slammed this week. Is, is there anything in upstream Kubernetes that you're aware of that would be interesting to call out for this week? Uh, I'm sure there are, but I think most of my downstream work has bleached my brain. Uh, yeah. so there was a couple of conversations that happened that I thought were interesting, but I've, uh, I've since expunged that from working memory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm just happy we found time on both of our schedules where we could do this session. Um, even if the agenda here is a little, uh, or the weekend review is a little bare. So if anybody knows of any interesting stuff, feel free to say it in chat or add it to the HackMD. Um, as always, the link is tgik.io slash notes. Um, we're happy to talk about different stuff and comment on things um, uh, if you do have any, any cool ideas. Okay, so what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, just to kind of skip right into it. Um, you've heard a bit about Tim. Uh, I think some of you know me from other episodes, but if you don't, my name's Josh. Uh, I have done kind of two ends of Kubernetes, both like helping folks set it up at large scale at various organizations. And now I work with Tim in an engineering capacity, uh, helping bootstrap something called Tanzu Community Edition. Um, and what we're going to kind of go through today is giving you a demo of what this thing is. We figure just getting some context in your head might be helpful before we, you know, jump right into it. And then the kind of, uh, you know, uh, hosts we have today, it'd be really good to jump into sort of the architecture behind it and talk about what we have going on under the hood. There's some pretty novel stuff going on in what Tanzu is doing. And I think it will invoke a lot of interesting questions that you all might have, and, and we're here to answer them. So maybe before we jump in, we'll call out a couple things. Um, Rory said, one, two, three, dropping next Tuesday with ephemeral container support enabled by default. So that's pretty cool. Been waiting to see how that was going to show up for a while now. Um, so thanks for adding that there, Rory. And inside of Week in Review, we've got some good reInvent news. We'll come back once these get filled in and maybe maybe talk about these a bit in a sec. But before we do, Tim, I, I wanted to ask you something that you had mentioned. You, you'd mentioned that you work on this thing called TKG. And before we get too deep into acronym soup land, which tends to be how VMware rolls, 
Yeah. You want to like tell us at a high level, like there's a lot of people in here who probably don't even know what the heck Tanzu even means. So maybe you could just kind of frame the idea of TKG and community edition and, and that kind of stuff. Sure. So like in the early days of Kubernetes or when we had early days of SIG cluster lifecycle, there was a bunch of componentry that we created and we were trying to build like a layered set of tooling. So trying to follow Unix philosophy and, and doing componentized layering is like super duper hard. Like you're not going to get this right on your first go. It's going to take you several iterations. And so you have like a bounding box for, you know, each individual tool that you're trying to build inside your tool chest. And so in the early days, you know, there was a common problem of bootstrapping and, and all these different tools uh, were all doing the same thing. So we sort of settled on a tool in the community using KubeADM. And now KubeADM is like the de facto bootstrapper for like a, a ton of tools. If you look at Kind, Minikube, uh, Cluster API, and all the providers around it, they're all using KubeADM at the core. Now go up, pop up a layer that only solves one problem, which is bootstrapping. So what happens if I want to do provisioning and I want to do it in declarative fashion? Then, then you start to get things into things like Cluster API, which is like, I want to be able to provision clusters like pods. Right? And I want to be able to declaratively manage them in that fashion. And so what TKG is and what Tanzu is, is meant to be sort of a wrapper or a set of tooling even above uh, Cluster API, which is managing the life cycle of Tanzu clusters. Right? And so that's basically a set of opinions that we're trying to bake into how we're distributing and managing clusters at scale. So that's like a simplified version of it. Cool. And as we get into some examples, uh, I'm sure y'all will come up with some questions and we're happy to, to kind of clarify as, as we go along. So let's talk a bit about uh, some of these other news items that came in and then we'll, we'll get into the, the demo here. Uh, so interesting news. I don't know if you saw this, Tim. I definitely hadn't. There, it looks like Docker has announced official images in ECR. So I browsed through this article as quick as possible. And I can't really tell what official means. Um, if someone in chat wants to add in, I was thinking like, these are like the NGINX where like, you can just call NGINX and pull NGINX. It's like an official uh, image, like pointed at without like a organization in the URL, or uh, I guess, what do you call it? Project or whatever in the URL. And it looks like uh, ECR has like a whole searchable way that we can go in now and uh, view some of these. So you know, elephant in the room, maybe a response to rate limiting um, for people that don't have Docker Hub accounts, but this is super, super interesting. It looks like for Amazon users in particular, what I read in the article is it does have some uh, pull through caching for like private VPCs. Mm -hmm. So that could be like a really compelling thing um, for folks who are trying to pull easier and faster. So the one nice thing that you got from Docker Hub uh, was that chain rebuilding for images, mm -hmm. right? So if you were going to do something, you had that chain rebuild, which was super useful. Um, I'm just kind of curious whether or not they kind of have that support or not, or if it's just a hosting service. Yeah, I, I would think it's more so a hosting, but this is a very small article. There might be more to it than what I see. So cool. Thanks for adding that. And then we also have a link in the HackMD2. Uh, as we'd mentioned from Rory, uh, there is uh, Kubernetes 123 is coming out. Check out this article from Sysdig. Looks like they go over a lot of the different enhancements and so on that are going on inside of this release. So uh, check it out if you want to dig into uh, to what's going on. And then you can uh, tell Tim and I what's going on in Kubernetes 123. So, <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Let's talk a little bit about demoing Tanzu Community Edition, and then we'll dive a bit into the architecture, uh, especially with Tim kind of showing off some of the stuff. So um, as I go through the demo too, Tim, feel free to, to jump in and add uh, where you'd like. So sure. I am going to start with my terminal window here. So let me, um, we're, we're getting used to this new Streamlab thing. So it might be a little, a little janky jumping around, but let's give it a shot. So I'm going to go to my terminal here and see if I can start us off with that. Okay, sweet. Uh, do one of these real quick. And chat, don't hesitate to say if the text is too small or anything like that. Um, so I'm just gonna go into the box I've got set up for this. Okay, entry point into Tanzu. For those of you who are like, okay, Tim described it, I kind of get it, starts with a T, it's relevant to Kubernetes, right? 
what do you actually get when you kind of start off here? So using a package manager, um, right now we've got brew and chocolatey. Uh, we're definitely planning to like get into like the yums of the world and, you know, maybe arch, I don't know, whatever package repos we can eventually get into. But for now you can do your whole brew install. We've got the docs on our website, um, and it will pull down a CLI. Now the CLI is your entry point to doing a lot of different things. Um, and what Tim will actually talk to us and, I, and myself as well will talk to us about a little bit later is how these different commands are composed. But for right now, like just from an end user perspective, we run Tanzu and we get a bunch of different commands that we can run, okay? Now, some of you might be familiar with the project cluster API. And those of you who have been around in bootstrapping clusters for a really long time have probably, are probably familiar with the idea of cube admin and how these things kind of layer together, right? So cluster API, in, in my definition, is solving a problem that every freaking organization using Kubernetes was solving for the longest time. They would get a cluster up, and then they would say like, okay, now I'd really like a way to like declare the state of a cluster I'd like and manage multiple clusters and scale them and blah, blah, blah. So many people, in, in my experience, would basically, with sticks and glue, create a bunch of automation pipelines and then try to put an API on top of it where they would ask for a cluster and then they would create that cluster. They could give it to a team or many teams depending on their tenancy story and so on. But cluster API takes a lot of the primitives we know and love in Kubernetes, which is you know declarative APIs. We send the state in, it reconciles and it applies that to cluster management. So I know a lot of that is review for y'all. But know that the backbone of what we're about to show you is built on that same open source project. So if I were to kind of get started here with, with, uh, uh, with Tanzu, what I'm probably going to start off with is running a command that is, let's bring this down so you can see it, which is Tanzu management cluster. The premise being we're going to have a cluster that manages many other clusters, OK? So uh, Alejandro, you said, is it possible to move the webcam boxes to the bottom right so you can see what you type? That's a great idea. Let's try, Tim, we'll hide our beautiful faces here for a moment. Okay, so uh, Tanzu management cluster, right? Now, with this in place, we can start off by creating a management cluster. Now, if you've used cluster API in the past, you might know that this is a process of uh, propagating some YAML with uh, you know, a couple different settings and all that good stuff. One of the things that you'll start off with with Tanzu Community Edition is a UI that will help you through that initial process of getting those, those pieces bootstrapped, okay? So if I did Tanzu Management Cluster Create, I'd ask to do it through the UI. Now, I've got this running on a remote host, so I'm going to specifically set up a bind address real quick. Um, but normally, we could, if you were just running this like on your local machine, you would just type enter or hit enter, and it would pop up a browser for you. Um, and I'm also going to say browser none since I'm going to come back to this. All right. So in creating our first management cluster, it's going to go ahead and say, cool, Josh, I'll help you out here. Here's a, a UI. And, and again, normally a browser would pop right up. Uh, but since you can't see my browser, I'm going to flip to that browser. Let's pop over to here again. All right. And if I go to my address, which was 333, and type in 9,000, I'll get a UI that looks something like this. All right. Now, again, kind of pairing the worlds of Tanzu and Cluster API a bit. Those who have used Cluster API, you might be aware of the concept of a provider, where providers let us go in and say, we want to take this declarative model of cluster management, and we want to apply it to vSphere. We want to apply it to AWS, Azure, Google, uh, Linode, uh, DigitalOcean, if they have one. I don't know. Tim probably knows the providers more exhaustively than me. But there's the idea with Cluster API is we have this declarative API and we put a provider underneath it to satisfy it. You know, we see this model everywhere, right? Like Ingress, we have an API, we put a controller underlying it to satisfy it, be it Nginx, Envoy, on and on. So in this case, what ships today with Tanzu Community Edition are four providers. Providers that let you run clusters locally, like in the case of Docker, and then providers that will let you run them remotely in a target IaaS or, or infrastructure of sorts. 
Now, um, I had a feeling you all didn't want to watch the paint dry for like 10 to 20 minutes. So I went ahead and bootstrapped a cluster, but I figured I'd just show you real quick what the process kind of looked like for me. So I went into AWS here. It would say, okay, Josh, cool. What's, what's going on? What's with AWS? I've got a profile loaded into my machine. So I'll go in and tell it what my profile is. And then when I connect, the key here is that it's going to actually help us understand what's available in that IaaS provider so that we can fill out effectively that, you know, under the hood, just YAML file uh, with the appropriate properties we need to bootstrap. So we go in next, we can attach to an existing VPC, we can create a new VPC, so on and so forth. Um, we can set the instance types, uh, you know, management cluster name, all that good stuff. It'll let us specify network settings, like what we want our pod and service CIDR to be. Um, identity management, if we want to hook into OIDC or LDAP. Uh, select a base image. In the case of AWS, your options will be Ubuntu and um, Amazon Linux. But Tim and I today can talk to you a bit about how you can actually bring different hosts as well. Um, and then there's also a SaaS offering from VMware that you have the option to hook into too called Tanzu Mission Control. So all of that's kind of wired up. And I'm going to show you when I kind of deployed here what, what this effectively created. But before I go any further, let's, let's answer some of these questions, Tim. Um, Rory said, is there a plan to have a provider for VMware Workstation? So we've chatted about it. There's no plan of record currently to expedite that. But one of the things we're trying to do with TCE is leverage both the community internal and external to VMware, right? Everything's in the open. So patch is welcome, right? So we're not, we are going to try to unlock those teams to help them sort of integrate. And we have all the plumbing and the tools available. Uh, we're not as pluggable yet as we want to be. And I'll talk about that later on. But I think, uh, by having this open community edition, we're trying to allow people to take the expression of what they want to do and be a platform platform on top of a platform platform. So, so if you consider Kubernetes to be a platform platform, right? You can do a lot of interesting things on top of it. And then if you think of TCE as, well, I want to render an expression of the things that I need for my environment on top of it, we want people to be able to do that. So that's part of the reason we're doing that in the open. So a lot of times people think of distributions. I would think a I would think of TCE more of as a platform platform. We have some opinions baked in, but we also allow people to build a top in and around it. And hopefully we're going to talk a little bit more later on about how to make it so pluggable that you could build a rendition of TCE that is your own. And we're trying to get there. We're going to get there soon, but I think that's the real power. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think we're getting more and more interest, especially with you know people on uh, you know various platforms using um, Docker Desktop, Rancher Desktop, so on, taking it a step further and being able to plug in some of these different providers. Um, the other question that we've got here is. Uh, Amerimigo, uh, can community edition be used in production for a commercial implementation? So um, one of the great things about TCE um, is that it does not have licensing that prevents your usage of it. So effectively, you know, um, you can be as dangerous as you want to be. Um, if, if you want to stand up clusters, try them out, try them out locally. If somehow you wake up in the morning and all of a sudden your company's running production workloads on it, right? Um, TCE is totally able to be used for that. We don't artificially limit like sizes of nodes or anything like that. Um, you know, obviously the big implication, like a lot of community projects, is that we support it in the community. So yeah. I'm out there, Tim's out there, our teams are out there in Slack and GitHub trying to answer as much questions as possible. Uh, and the community is as well. But, you know, as you know, uh, you also don't have a direct line to a, a phone number to uh, to call me if something goes terribly wrong, which is what um, some of the fancier enterprisey things would allow you to do. Yep, and and like we were mentioning earlier too, is that um, so TCE is meant to be the upstream platform platform uh, to the rest of Tanzu, right? And so you know if there is ever a case where you're building like an ISV ecosystem around something and you want to be able to offer support like we're trying to build the plumbing so that the transition is natural right so a lot of times if you were to go to a distribution it's not really something you would inherently try to customize and build a top of it's so tailored to a product driven user story 
we're trying to build something that's literally customizable. So you could take it, render a rendition or a set of opinions into it. And then should you want to get support, we have you know, the mechanism to do that later on. Cool. All right. We've got uh, two other questions uh, in chat here. I'm going to go ahead and, and demo a little bit more, and then we'll come to those. Um, so let's go ahead and flip back to the terminal window here. Um, okay. So I've showed you a bit of the UI, and I have, like I mentioned, bootstrapped some clusters just so that we can kind of get this thing rolling. So Effectively, what we've got going on here is I've got a management cluster stood up now, and I have got a workload cluster stood up as well. Um, so again, it's that one-to-many relationship. We'll have one management cluster in most deployment models managing one or many workload clusters. So how did I go through and actually kind of create these things? Um, I'll come back to this window in a second. We'll just talk about my management cluster. So if I run Tanzu management cluster get here, it's going to give me some details about the management cluster that I currently have running on my machine. So you can see here, it's uh, TGIK MMC. You can see some details about its infrastructure provider. It's using AWS as the provider itself. Um, it uh, gives us some details about the CAPI components that are running inside of here as well. Um, so kind of like we talked about, there's, there's multiple layers here. There's things that look at the actual cluster API APIs and then try to satisfy them on different levels, like at a cube admin level or at an infrastructure provider level to actually, you know, in the case of AWS, create the EC2 instances and VPC and so on that's needed. Um, and then there's the actual core cluster API provider itself. Um, so yeah, I've got a management cluster running. It can manage workload clusters. Now, with this running from that initial UI, what I was able to do here, and I've kind of fast forwarded for the sake of this demo, is I ran this command right here. Um, this is basically saying, hey, I am locked into my management cluster. And using that management cluster, I want to go ahead and create a workload cluster based on a configuration file. Now, this configuration file actually came from that UI that I was showing you a little bit earlier. Maybe we can take like a, a super quick peek into it for those that are curious. So effectively, what I've got going on here is uh, a bunch of YAML that is saying how I want my cluster to be uh, bootstrapped. And this is, again, all sourced from the UI. But of course, you know, uh, I don't even want to say advanced users. I just think users who do more than proof of concepts you'll end up getting to a point where you're mostly going through these configuration files, setting them up, perhaps version controlling them, and then just doing all of your bootstrapping off on the basis of this kind of stuff. Um, and you know that's when templating and all kinds of other crazy stuff comes into play. But nonetheless, this is the underlying file that's basically feeding the Tanzu CLI, telling it the details about where I should be deploying my workload cluster and the details about how it should run. Right. So it went through, it created the workload cluster, and now the management cluster is managing the workload cluster. So essentially, we've got like two levels of commands here, right? We've got the Tanzu management cluster command, which is going to give us the ability to uh, upgrade, uh, get credentials, delete it, so on and so forth. But once the management cluster's up, we're probably going to mostly work with the Tanzu, uh, Tanzu cluster command. And the Tanzu cluster command is going to be a way from a CLI that we can actually alter uh, the we can alter the uh, the guest cluster or sorry guest clusters the workload clusters that we're creating. So if I wanted to scale that cluster up that I just created, right? Um, if I wanted to see what clusters I have available, so Tanzu cluster list, it'll actually tell me which workload clusters are currently running underneath that single management cluster. So all of this can be kind of viewed inside of here. Now, again, just to kind of bring the plumbing full circle, what we've got going on here is basically interactions with the same cluster API primitives a lot of you are used to upstream. And that's a really powerful construct to have at your fingertips um, when you're using enterprise software. We're not just like fully taking that away from you. So you know, maybe to just give like a, a quick example here, let's do um, Tanzu management cluster uh, and I'll I'll fumble with the commands here because it's been it's been a while since I've done it, but it'll be something like Tanzu management cluster management management cluster 
uh, cube config. I think the flag's admin. Oh, get admin. Okay, sweet. So while I can interact with these clusters through Tanzu CLI, I can, of course, interact with them through kubectl as well. So in my case, I'm, I'm a very elevated admin here. I'm going to go in and set my context to this cluster. And let's just take like a quick look inside of what we've got going, going on in this cluster. So pretty standard cluster API cluster. Um, you got a CNI inside of here, in our case, Entrea. We've got the cluster API AWS provider running that's actually reconciling, again, the resources in AWS. We've got all the different CAPI components as well. Now, like you saw me just do with like Tanzu cluster list and so on, all of that is powered from the same cluster API primitives that we're used to. So if we do cube cuddle and we do get cluster, right, we're going to actually see the clusters that are known inside of here, which in the case of our management cluster, it's going to be the guest cluster that it's managing. And it's also going to be itself because the management cluster is just another cluster. It, it just happens to be kind of like self-managing and has these extra, extra cappy components in it. Um, all right, and we're going to get into this concept of packaging very soon, but Tim, I think we should answer some more chat questions here. Um, Chris asked um, about Oracle cloud support uh, for working with their ARM64 box. It's probably pretty similar to what you talked about earlier about making this pluggable, yeah? Yeah, so you could... <clears throat> In theory, in the future, you could be able to plug in whatever cloud provider integration you wanted to. Um, and, you know, there's portions of the bootstrapping, which is broken up into two different parts. Like there's the bootstrapping of the management cluster, then there's bootstrapping of the workload clusters. And if we do the pluggable model correctly, you could just update that and create your own custom TKR to build whatever you wanted to build, right? So if, say for example, I wanted to create a hybridized approach where it's like Oracle and Amazon, you know, you could customize that uh, to the nth degree. So that's kind of what we're building. Um, so it's not all there there today though, um, we're getting there. Uh, so the foundations are there. We're trying to make some code changes and probably in the next three to six months or so, you'll start to see all of this light up and be a lot cleaner. And uh, Amero Amigo, I missed your other question. You asked, does, Tons does Community Edition also support Tonzu Build Service and Asset Catalog? And that is definitely something that we're looking to expose. Um, Tim, do you want to add any other details on that? Yeah, I, folks are working on it and to build it, plummet through TC. I think what you'll find is that uh, there's going to be the open source rendition and the community rendition of things playing through TCE. So there will be the OSS rendition of stuff will flow through TCE. And then there will also be like the productized renditions will be on the downstream side of things. So there will be an, an op open source upstream, which might not be like, you know, all the fit and finish and polish that you would want, but all the user configurability in the world um, will be there. And then on the downstream side will be the product side. And Alex asked, uh, how does Tanzu compare to Rancher for managing other workload clusters? Um, and I think there actually is some overlap between the two because I think Rancher is leveraging cluster API to some degree, albeit yeah, perhaps maybe modified a bit. I can't speak to it now because I, I, I can speak to what it was. I can't speak to it now because I don't, they changed or shifted their model. So I do know that they are leveraging cluster API now. Um, I think, you know, we are trying to build, uh, again, like a platform platform. So the foundations are how do I build and mold things atop of it and to have that strict layering model, um, as well as having the, you know, the support guarantees in the downstream product side. So. Awesome. Uh, and Nick said it would be pretty neat to tell Tanzu to instantiate multiple clusters to have them interconnected uh, with something like Gimbal. Um, so, hey, Nick, glad that you're here. Uh, Nick and I worked together at CoreOS and worked with Tim and I at, uh, at Heptio, which is where the Gimbal drop comes from. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like, um, I don't know if I should call it the next, the next frontier, Tim, because we're kind of already there. But like, once we stitch together all of these pieces and have these models around packaging that Tim and I are going to show you, Mm -hmm. The like multi-cluster resolution of things, whether it be a GSLB to like just making sure packages on clusters are consistently reconciled um, is like is where a lot of pain is today. I'll put it that way. Right. And something that we're really interested in figuring out. Yeah. So 
we are getting very close to having like the fully declarative spec model <clears throat> of saying, I want an opinionated full multi-cluster distribution, go Tanzu go, right? Um, we are we are a couple steps away from that. We are getting very close to it though. Cool. Um, and YMO, you said, sorry if I missed this. Is it supposed to make CNI across clusters easier? Um, so YMO, yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of packages pretty soon here. Um, and effectively, there's going to be ways that you can plug different things in, you know, be it a CNI that can stretch across multiple clusters. Um, and it, it's a bit of a complex question because there's a lot of ways to do multi-cluster connectivity and on different levels for that matter. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that and, and feel free to ask us again when we get into it if, if we can help uh, answer some more. Um, Okay, let's talk a bit about packages, Tim, and then we'll uh, we'll come back to more questions here. So I'll go to this thing here. All right, so you all have seen, um, you all have now seen the creation of a cluster, showed you a little bit about what's going on with cluster API behind the scenes. Now, um, at this point, not to downgrade our efforts, but we've just got a Kubernetes cluster, <laughs> and that's not necessarily that impressive um, at, at, at surface level, right? When we create our clusters, it's oftentimes about like the value add we derive on top of it. Um, if we just gave all of our developers Kubernetes clusters, a lot of shops would say, "Wow, so now you're asking me to write code and be a Kubernetes expert, right? We actually want to be able to like provide platform services. This can be load balancing, secret management storage integration, you know, blah, blah, blah. The list goes on and, and, and has high variance between all of your use cases. Now, what am I getting at with packages? So essentially, we've got a cluster. Let's see if we can bring back up our cluster list here. So the cluster that we know that exists is TGIK guest. So let's see if I can do that same thing. Cluster cube config uh, get admin. Um, cluster cube can take a cluster name because we've got a specific cluster. So again, I'm, I'm operating on like highly elevated admin privileges here. Um, this all can integrate through like OIDC and things like that, but I'm just keeping it simple. So I have grabbed the admin cube config from TGIK guest. I am going to set my cube cuddle context here. Um, cool. And now just to do a quick sanity check, we'll do a cube cuddle get pods all. All right. Now, this is what a vanilla workload cluster looks like, just to kind of frame this a bit. And I don't want to steal too much thunder from when Tim and I talk about architecture, but just to make you aware, there's a CNI in here. There's the cube components. There is something called a capabilities controller manager. But one thing I want to point out is this, this very important process or container that's running called cap controller. And this is going to be highly relevant to what we talk about with, with packages here. So inside of Tanzu CLI, now that I'm pointed at that workload cluster, I've also got the ability to run a Tanzu package command. And those of you who have worked in a Linux environment or, you know, frankly, Mac or Windows, who is copying a lot of the greatness of package management that Linux has been doing for years, right? Um, you're, probably, you're probably aware of where this is going. The idea to discover, look up, install, configure packages on a cluster in a similar way that you're used to with apt, with yum, with pacman, with brew. So let's start off by taking a quick look at the packages that are available inside of this cluster. So I am going to run a Tanzu package available list in say all dash a. Okay. Now what's interesting about this, and I'm sure something Tim and I will talk about a lot is not only have we, we're getting to this point where like everything is declarative, but we're getting to this point where almost everything can be encapsulated in this idea of a package. So without getting too deep into that right now, an example would be that a package that is available to the cluster, and, and I want to kind of reiterate that this is available to the cluster. It doesn't mean installed in the cluster, but is, is available, would be Entrea or Calico, and also could include Cilium or Weave. Right. The idea being that if we have this consistent primitive that we load into the clusters, we can very easily install a lot of these these different pieces. Now, the ones you're looking at right here, interestingly enough, some of them are already installed. And a lot of these are like lower level components, things that you're probably not going to actually install 
after the fact. These are like what we sometimes refer to as our core packages. They're they're in the cluster. Some of them are installed. Um, some of them are are uh, running right now. Now there is this idea of bringing a I don't know if higher level would be the right descriptor, but like a, a, a new set of packages to the forefront that we want to install, perhaps install, let's say outside of cluster bootstrapping. So I'm gonna call these for the sake of simplicity, user managed packages, packages that users will install. Um, so what we can do here, kind of similar to how you can add like a, a package repo using your favorite package manager, right? We can come in here and we can say package repository Okay, and it's super important to spell it correctly. Um, and we can list the package repositories. And uh, right now, oh, sorry, they're also namespace scoped. Uh, and right now we have a Tanzu core. So this is again, a lower level package repo. You probably won't touch it too much. Although there are some cool ways we're looking forward to letting people extend slash mutate this, but that's for another day. I wanna bring higher level functionality in is where I'm going with this. I want to bring in an ingress controller. I want to bring in a, uh, a secret management solution, a, a log forwarding component, whatever it might be. So what I'm going to do here, similar to what you would do in Linux, I'm going to add a, another package repository to the mix to make it available and installable inside of the cluster. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab the URL for the community edition repo real quick here. Um, and I'm going to paste this in so that you all can see. So we're going to say Tanzu package repository add. We're going to call it TCE repo. We're going to point it at this URL. Now you might notice that this URL looks a lot like a container image, right? So using the OCI format, as you've noticed with things like Helm charts and those of you who have worked with Carvel packages, um, OCI is, is really breaking out of just being a packaging format for container file systems. It's very much becoming a, a general, a, hopefully this doesn't get me in trouble, but more of like almost like a general purpose file system. We bundle things up, they go into this OCI uh, structure and we can reference them. And this is what our package repository is. And I'm also gonna pump it into a specific namespace that will make it globally available. So we'll go ahead and add this repository here. Let it go ahead and reconcile. Um, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll take a look at the packages and then, and then, um, answer, answer some more questions here. Um, it might take a second for it to reconcile. Um, maybe we'll look at a question real quick, Tim, while it's reconciling. Uh, do, do, do. Rory said, in terms of authentication, how does Tanzu handle that with cube configs you are retrieving? Is it client cert auth? So there... There are packages that we have for day one operations for configuring, you know, whatever authentication service you have and identifying your users and binding them to a certain set of configurations. So the, the tool we use is Pinniped uh, and Pinniped has uh, tons of knobs <laughs> uh, and configuration apparatus. But the, the idea is that you should be able to do Tanzu once you have Pinniped integrated it, with your identity service, you'll be able to loosely bind uh, and set up your uh, user identities and, and set up your RBAC roles in your environment. Then you should be able to do Tanzu login. And that Tanzu login should then federate out to your identity provider, come back once you've been okayed, and then it will give you a time scoped cert that cert's embedded into your kube config and away you go. Um, so that's usually a day one operation. So out of the box, what we're kind of doing with a lot of this stuff right now is just you know, root level access. We're not really doing day one sort of configuration of users and how to integrate with your, uh, you know, identity provider. Yeah. And we got another good question from uh, Amero Amigo. Uh, what is the best way to work with repository air gaps and air gap networks? So this will probably get a bit into your architecture thing, Tim, but maybe we can talk about kind of this package primitive and how we can so easily kind of move things around uh, in an air gapped case. Yeah, so so packages are recursive, and there's a different name for that inside of uh, the Carvel tooling. They they call it a different name, but it basically means a package can go inside a package, which can go inside a package. So that's really clever and cool, and opens up a whole set of things. So you can what you can do is you can say an entire repository, which is a set of packages, and using the Carvel tooling, you can because there. Are, basically YAML manifests inside of there with references to containers, you can 
rip down and retarget all of those to your local environment and reference them directly. So there's a, a tool called KBuild, um, which is part of the Carville tooling, which allows you to just retarget everything inside of a package uh, and away you go. Cool. And then we'll hit on YMOs as well up there. Is it possible to do multi-cluster with kind to minimize costs and um it might depend a little bit on exactly what you mean with by multi-cluster but i'm going to take some liberty here the docker provider um which i don't know if you saw in the beginning of the session ymo will let you do something very similar to what you're describing what it will do is it'll set up a management cluster using kind images with some small modifications that we do to them and then that management cluster running uh via kind via docker can then stand up many uh, workload clusters from there. So like, you know, obviously that's not a production model of deployment, but to your point about minimizing costs and just learning, that's how I, and probably a lot of engineers on Tim and I's teams uh, just do their testing and, and validation. We use the kind provider or Docker provider. We spin up clusters and this whole package management model and all that stuff is, is still fully functional. Cool. Okay. Um, so let's go back and actually look at these packages here. So I have reconciled a package in the cluster using this Tanzu package repository command. If we go back and say Tanzu package repository list, and once again, remember that it's namespace scoped, we're now going to see a TCE repo inside of here as well. So the idea here being, when you deploy Tanzu Community Edition, we have a Community Edition package repository. And this repo is very much in its infancy. But the cool thing about it is we can bring a bunch of additional functionality that people can install and deploy into their cluster. So let's take a quick peek at what's available in there. If I now do a Tanzu package available list, it'll go through. It will list all the packages. Sorry, it's kind of wrapping and ugly here, but if you can sort of actually... Yeah, I won't even bother with grepping through that. Um, you can see a bunch of packages in the left side here. You'll see things like Grafana, Gatekeeper, FluentBit, External DNS, Contour, Cert Manager. This is our package repo we ship by default. We're thinking about ways that we can let people bring more packages into like a, com a completely community supported repo. And also, you can bring your own packages in just arbitrarily. Um, with your own repos as well. So this is highly, highly extensible built on this package primitive. So without getting too wordy on the architecture, um, let's install one of these packages just to maybe give like a quick example of what it might look like. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend we want to install Cert Manager. It won't, it won't be the you know fanciest demo. I won't be playing a video game on Kubernetes, but you'll get the idea. So if we do Tanzu package avail available list, and we ask for cert manager. Let's grab that up here. Seems good. It's going to actually retrieve some information about cert manager. So like a lot of package repositories, not only can we ship these packages, but we can ship different versions of the packages accordingly and then provide upgrades between the different packages and the different versions. So let's pretend for a moment that I want to install cert manager on the cluster, specifically cert manager uh, 153. So now I can come in and I can say Tanzu package install. All right. And I'll say cert manager. Now, this is just the name of it. Um, I still need to say what the actual package represents, or maybe I should call it like this is the name of the instance of installation. And I need to reference an actual package. So the package name here is going to be our friend cert manager. And then, of course, we need to specify a version here too, because we want to make sure we pick up the right one. Uh, and we'll say version is 153. All right. Now, before I hit enter, let's pull up some windows so we can sort of watch the paint dry for a moment. Um, so if I do a cube cuddle get pods, all, actually, no, we'll do it in this window. We'll do a cube cuddle get pods all. We'll watch that. Seems pretty good. OK. Um, and then inside of another window down here, I'm going to uh, actually expose you to like an underlying detail that we can watch to. So if we do watch kubectl get package install, 
I've got that CRD right. Um, I'm going to put in the default namespace, so I think this should work. I'm pretty sure this should work. We'll see. Um, let me just triple check real quick, make sure. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Lovely. Okay. So pods are being showed up here on a watch. Package install is being showed down here. I am going to go ahead and install this package. So let's go ahead and hit that. It will start the installation process for us. And if we look down here, you'll see the declaration of the installed package show up. So this is a package install object. It is reconciling. You'll see in the top here, the actual cert manager pods are then being instantiated. So Tim will show you this visually, but if you can imagine the chain here, we declared intent to install a package. Cap controller is able to understand, oh, cert manager, you want that. Oh, configuration for cert managers here. Oh, here's customization Tim and Josh put in for cert manager, which I didn't put any customization in, but that's possible. And then it actually goes through and satisfies the install of cert manager right here. So that is the general flow of installing these packages. You know, the one thing that we're sort of uh, overlooking here at this point is just how we get the, the configuration of the packages. So there's a schema that's made available for these different packages as well, which um, we can talk a little bit about later. Um, but kind of similar to the idea of a values file, um, there's also this construct that we call overlays that we can dig into. We can customize all the things about Cert Manager. Um, we can we can look up a schema and Cert Manager will basically say, here's some knobs that you can turn. But on top of those knobs, we could introduce our own knobs. There's, there's endless amounts of customization to these deployments. Okay, so. Let's take a quick look at chat here. Um, oh yeah, I guess, uh, Miramigo, you asked Carvel. I guess Tim and I have been, or Carvel, you, we've been throwing that term around quite a bit. Um, Tim, you think you can give like a super high level on that one? Um, it's a set of tools. Each tool does a very specific job. Um, we're kind of referencing, in, in particular, we're referencing like the package to packaging tool and the K and K app. So um, that's one of the tools in the tool chain, but they kind of all come together to form, a, you know, almost like a Voltron for application management. And so what we're referencing are the image package, K app and the K app controller. Uh, I did mention earlier K build, uh, as well as, you know, the templating format that allows us to do substitution, all kinds of fancy things with overlays. That's YTT. And we, we do get a lot of questions too about, um, you know, differences with projects like Helm. Um, and that's definitely a, a deep topic to go into. But one of the cool things about this, this packaging model is it's totally possible to take a Helm chart and expose it in the same packaging construct um, to be able to discover it, um, provide different configuration for it and install it into the cluster. So um, like Tim said, it really speaks to the composability of these blocks. It's not like a you're using Carvel, you're in all six of these, there's actually different parts that can be subbed. I saw you on mute, Tim. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, so like, you know, you can pick your favorite templating engine if you wanted to, and you could potentially substout, you know, whatever templating you decide is, is worthwhile for you or what makes the most sense for you. Um, we're kind of standardizing on our packaging to use, you know, YTT templating out of the box, but that doesn't mean you, it, you're bound into it. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so it's it's a pluggable model to basically compose. At the end of the day, we're trying to take some of these things and compose them into higher order constructs. And those higher order constructs are then really, really, really powerful for sort of building an ecosystem or a platform. Um, so that way, if a person wants to build their own package repository bundle, they can go ahead and do that and bundle it in and build a top of it, as well as have an opinionated deployment configuration Everything is a package inside of Tanzu is what we're getting towards. And if you view it in that model, all of a sudden it starts to unlock a set of possibilities, right? Absolutely. Um, and then Nick hit on a, a good question. Um, and this is kind of a merging of different paradigms around infrastructure as code is a very popular model. Mm -hmm. Is there integration with Tanzu for something like the Terraforms of the world or even like the Pulumis of the world? Yeah, absolutely. There's no reason why you can't you can't integrate in and around Tanzu with with Terraform. There's all kinds of hook mechanics you can use. It depends what you're trying to do, really, because 
provisioning, there's so many steps. Like Terraform usually is all about provisioning. And so you can do a pre or post set of operations. You can have hooks and mechanics into stuff on your clusters. You can do whatever you really want to do. So it's pretty much a dealer's choice. Now, should we probably provide good reference examples? Yeah, we should. Uh, I think we're just, we're re very early days at this point. Um, and Nick, you asked if Carvel's case on it too. Um, I would, I would say no, but there's definitely overlap, um, in, in certain aspects. Yeah. I, I wouldn't view it as case on it. Case on it is only like the templating bit, right? So, um, YTT is the uh, closest equivalent to case on it. I think that YTT is a lot case on it was really powerful. You can do anything with case on it. The problem is like it is very difficult for people to parse, right? You have to learn another language that is not standardized language formats that most people are accustomed to. Uh, that said, case on it is very powerful. Um, but with YTT, we're basically, you know, it, it's inlined YAML that's basically a what's the Python extension tool? I forgot the name of it. Um, sorry. I'll have to dig it up here for a second. Yeah, I'm not sure either off the top of my head. Do, do, do. Go to YTT. Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about Starlark? Yes, thank oh, you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't realize you were talking about that. Got it. <laughs> yeah. So it's basically you're you're inserting you're inserting Starlark style comment blocks inside of YAML, which allows you to do very powerful things for transforms. And kind of as an aside of what we were talking about, I figured I'd show you all something that I was kind of referring to regarding package customization. If I can remember the five arguments I need to get right here. Let's see. Okay, there we go. So um, I'll, I'll explain what this is. But basically, um, a lot of these packages and the idea around these packages, of course, is to be able to discover them, but also be able to understand the package author's intent around knobs that you can introduce um, or that they've introduced, I should say. So like if I look at the Prometheus package, for example, um, using that same package available get, I can ask for a value schema. Um, so we'll grab that and I'm just going to pipe this into Vim so it's a little less chaotic to look at. Um, there we go. So uh, that output, although it's in an editor now, will actually tell me right from the package manager, here are the different knobs that we expose. You know, obviously I, you just saw me install cert manager with no customization. So uh, a lot of packages try to have sensible defaults at least to get you bootstrapped. But when you want to go in and actually change things about them, you can understand what knobs are available and then what the actual values are that you can set. And then we can provide alternative values files to the package. Um, and then, you know, finally, although I'm not going to show it here, when you get really, really advanced, um, you can even provide your own overlays on top of packages. Because um, we all know the cat and mouse game, right? When you abstract something and then try to open up little knobs, you never satisfy the world. <laughs> um, but the idea of overlays really give you that power to provide the customization you need and, and potentially even expose your own knobs. Yeah, and you can do all kinds of fancy things around policy too with overlays. So say, for example, you have a policy for inbound things that you want to apply to packages that get installed. You can easily apply those you know, by using overlays. And that's the same, like if you look at the original models that we had a long time ago around case on it, that was really the game and power that you're trying to do is like all of a sudden you want to have uh, default policies around uh, how logging gets appended inside of every pod that flows through uh, or for packages that get installed. And all of a sudden you can just apply that overlay to the package install uh, as part of the, you know, mutating webhook on inbound. Cool. Um, and then I think we've got one more question that's unanswered and then we can switch over to some architecture stuff. So Amir Amigo, you asked, uh, can community edition do CNB build packs? Um, also something that we're looking at, um, having in here as well, um, different ways that you can instantiate like platforms for doing build packs and, and all kinds of stuff. So it's not there today, but, um, no reason why it couldn't be. So, yeah. So, you know, if we want to, we can start going into like big picture mode and big block diagrams and, and see how folks roll from there. Sounds great. Um, let's do it. So let's see if I don't, uh, 
uh, inspect the universe here. So allow myself to introduce myself. I, I think we're inception. So if I go over to here, and hopefully you can see this one, right? I think it's on the screen, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. There you go. Um, so like, what is the 60,000 foot view of all of this? And this, this says TKG management cluster, but it's just, you know, TCE management cluster is that really everything is a package is a package is a package. Um, if you start to develop this model, that means every componentry that we're building is basically a set of packages, CLI plugins, which were basically the subcommands that you were seeing. All subcommands eventually will be a plugin, which will be a package. And that means you can amend and add packages to it. Uh, ideally, we want to get to the point where even the CLI has the notion of a repository. And in that scenario, it'll come with a default set of packages, but you could apply a separate set of things. So you could build out you know, your TCE redition that you want to, your customized TCE redition just by building on a set of plugin packages, right? Uh, then there's a set of APIs that live at the management layer. And I think one of the things that is kind of underlooked with cluster API is that because you have this top level layer, it's really a control plane. It's a multi-cluster control plane. And a, we basically install by default uh, a set of applications, and there will be more as well, which are basically management plane layer things. So if I were gonna, if I wanted to say, for example, like Nick was mentioning, auto install Gimbal and hook it up, uh, as well as provide an API for for management, that would be sort of a management level plane thing. Um, there's also the notion of being able to spin up maybe a cluster for a sp specific purpose and binding in. Uh, sort of service projection into my workload clusters. That could be like a service uh, element, right? The the opportunities for having this one layer of indirection is pretty endless. So you have a you have a multi cluster control plane. It's it's a choose your own adventure from that point. Uh, then, as Josh was demoing before, like there is basically the notion of installing individual applications onto your workload clusters. So you can go ahead and just have at it with installing apps there. Um, so you know you can set up separate repo bundles. This is an example of just one very simplified picture. But hopefully you're getting the notion that like a package is everywhere and a package is fractal, and it, the applications only depend upon where you're installing it. Tim, an interesting question, and I know this is very forward looking, but you know one thing we have today that seems to be out of the package model is. Um, a host image, right? Um, like, do you foresee even on that level that potentially eventually becoming a package itself? There's no reason it couldn't. Uh, we've talked about it. Like, ideally, because if you can containerize an actual image itself, which you can do, uh, it gets a little weird with some things like an OVA uh, that we have the potential of basically making everything sort of a container. If everything's a container, then everything can be a package. And all packages is basically bundling up a set of YAML plus knobs and manifests and overrides into it. But we're also like, we're trying to think beyond just the configuration and deployment, but how do I actually, you know, eventually with packages, we're also thinking about the build aspect of them too as well. And then YMO asked something around policy. Um, so as I can use something like OPA to say what packages can be installed. So put another Absolutely. way, I think like could you introduce admission control to do validation on what packages are allowed and you know that level of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So you could you could set up it's gatekeeper, so you can do whatever you want. And so you could set up you know only these repos are allowed, uh, or only you know these package packages are allowed. So it could be. You know, the, the gates usually go up the higher up the food chain you go. So if you're in dev, it's like YOLO, do whatever. Then you're in stage. It's like you're trying to put up some guards that kind of look like prod, but you're still trying things out. And then you're in prod. It's like, you know, you have to have <laughs> double admission badges to get through the gates, right? Absolutely. In fact, um, as a example of a package that might be validating packages, um, I did a quick package available list. If you had a cluster up right now, YMO, you could in theory install Gatekeeper as that package, provide your OPA policies in, like Tim said, 
And then that could be like OPA can do in admission control in general. It could look at the resources of packages um, and understand what you want to allow to be deployed and, and so on. So. Cool. Um, so I could ask you more questions, Tim, but was there something else that you wanted to show or talk about? I don't want to derail your train of thought. Tim, I think you're software muted. Yeah, I'm just looking at my notes. Cool. Um, so by having everything be a package and by having TCE out in the open, you know, what we're trying to do is when I say platform, platform, you can easily customize whatever you need to do, right? So if a person needs, if you're an ISV partner, for example, or if you're any person who's trying to provide services in and around Kubernetes, you can build an opinionated thing atop of that, fully plug that thing inside of there. So, and be able to support that going forward. So that's an interesting model that most people don't actually do. So I, I think that it's a unique opportunity for folks to poke around and get their feet wet with, because I think once you do that, there's a lot of power there that is different. And once you get it, once it's like kind of like taking the Kool-Aid or the blue pill or something or the red pill, like once you, once you take the red pill, you're just like, whoa, that unlocks a certain sets of things that I could never do before. So extensibility galore is basically what you're getting towards. Extensible CLI plugins, extensible sort of package sets, extensible distributions, like customizing it to the T that you want it to be at. Um, and maybe on that point of extensible distributions, obviously a big player in here is the term that we throw around all the time, bomb or mm -hmm. bill of materials. Um, I can show, I can show it on my screen if you want me to, but, uh, I was just curious if you want to like speak to what that is and why it's important. Yeah. If, if I start out real simple, like what is, what is a distribution, right? So a distribution, if we, if you view it as a collection of packages, you're going to have package A, B, C, we'll just make it simple. And then for this, you have versions of it, right? You have versions one, two, and three. And um, I'm just kind of drawing here. Now, a distribution is a collection of those things. Uh, sometimes in the old school parlance, people would call it like a stream, right? So if we we're talking about TC, it might be something like, this right and so tce 1.4 uh, or something like that it might default to a, a stream of packages right and so when we're saying we can customize it is the bundling that you want to get and the defaults that you want to get are are so customizable that you could basically take this and create your own stream atop of it for your own distribution Right. This allows you to basically say, like, I want an opinionated version of something which has X, Y, and Z. Oh, and it also has, you know, D and other things that you want. So an example here might be is I'm going to have a customized build for a certain set of scenarios, right? That might be something tailored for small use cases or something, right? And you could easily do that. So you could have like a... Uh, t like if you were to think about a lot of other distributions, they they sometimes have tailored versions. They have the ARM64 small version. Uh, you might have like an edge version, or you might have a uh, you know it, it a big data version or whatever. But that allows you like all the customizability you can think of. Cool. Yeah, and what these um bombs or bill of materials kind of translate to for those of you who try out Tanzu and kind of want to look at what they look like under the hood. Um, where's my screen at? Here is one. So on that uh, local bootstrapping machine, uh, the bomb itself was a package. Um, so you pretty much, you're pretty much like 97, you have a 97% chance of being right. If you assume the thing you're looking at as a package in Tanzu. Um, so the TKR bomb, it's a package. It's on my local file system in this case. And if I open it up, it declares um, a lot of the things that kind of make up this, this distribution. 
um, which is which is a really powerful declarative way to to do things. So inside of here, um, I've got everything from my package uh, repos and where those are. So remember that core repo I was showing you and how it had some default packages like Entrea and uh, CSI, CNI stuff, cap controller, blah, blah, blah. All that's declared in here. And then even like those OS image pieces, um, which searching for OS, there we go, uh, will have the different OS images based on different providers for this distro. Um, and yeah, it's just like, you know, so Tim's more on like the, the Tanzu architecture you know, all the things and I'm on like the TCE side. So like for me, I am or my team and, and what we build is, is a distribution of this thing. So this is like the lifeblood of what we do, right? The ability to go in and plug into one of these things, be able to customize it, be able to um, do a lot of cool stuff. Like we're not quite there yet, but for example, you know, there's going to be product that VMware cares a lot about. But y'all in the community might be like, oh, forget product. I want like bleeding edge Kubernetes versions and weird CNIs and blah, 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 right? And we're going to be able to put those kind of things into our distribution um, at a both quicker cadence and uh, quicker cadence and more experimental um, with a more experimental gate, I guess you could say. Um, so this is a really important concept for, for TC itself. And I think if we get there, Tim, it'll be really cool. And we have some tooling to help people create their own versions of these things, or at least customize them. Right. Yep. And so you're pointing at like, one of the things we're trying to work out right now is he's looking at the TK air bomb, but one of the things we're trying to be able to do is make it super seamless for people to build their own TKRs. And the TKRs are kind of composed into a couple of different layers. Right. And so we're trying, we're currently working through this stuff right now. But I think that you know we are getting to the point where uh, we have enough of the foundation and the plumbing so that way a person could create a, a customized TKR and be able to share that with the community. So I want to make my super micro opinionated uh, TKR that works really well for ARM devices. You can go to town, right? Uh, and that way a person can like spin up environments for that and uh, make it you know, really customized for whatever you're trying to do. Uh, does bomb stand for something? Bill of materials. Um, there's another question that says, what happens in the day two scenarios as if a package gets updated? Uh, is there an installer that would pick it up or install and say in dev cluster or an example in automated way? Yes, you could. So there's there's multiple ways that we we haven't we haven't standardized on how we want to do multiple version release in, leases but because it's just an oci build artifact you can just basically say i get the new rev of the container that new rev of the container contains all the versions yeah and because every package contains information about its upgradability as well as like the scripts that are associated with upgrades you could just rip through that bomb and upgrade everything or you could do it on a piecemeal fashion you can basically list what packages are installed and what upgrades are available that that already exists today and check this out on this like concept of the bomb and TKR uh, standpoint, right? So remember, we have this management cluster and this workload cluster right now. So if I did Tanzu Kubernetes release, okay? So this is where, by the way, the TKR comes from. Um, and we did uh, get. Here you can see those bombs that are in there. What really excites me is, again, like, this idea that Tim said about shipping like uh, a variety of ways to bootstrap and deploy clusters, different OS images, whatever whatever the things are that you're changing. And you go in here through the CLI and you're instantiating clusters all over the place using these different TKRs. You know, maybe over here you bootstrap this workload cluster with TKR, TCE, bleeding edge, crazy, dangerous you're probably going to have pain. And then over here, you use like some really enterprise -y TKR that's like our mainstream thingy, right? Or a custom version. So again, it kind of speaks this like, you're, you're, not, you're not only just creating your distribution to stand up a cluster, you're, you're able to slot these in in a way that when you create a new cluster, you can associate it with one of these bill of materials and it can be bootstrapped in its own unique way that's declared by that bill of materials, if that kind of makes sense and brings it full, full circle. Uh, yeah, there's a question here, uh, but does it come with an automated installer or do I have to write it? Um, so the way it's structured is installation has like a set of config knobs that pass in. 
TKR is something that you could build separately. If you build your own TKR, then you're going to be responsible for the versioning from A to B. But you know, TCE builds a TKR, and we do the versioning for that. TKG, which is basically the the downstream equivalent, uh, plus plus or minus minus actually, uh, does that automation for you. So you know, we ensure that every version of a TKR can go from lockstep to the next version, and you know, TCE will be doing that for you too as well. Will there be some hiccups or bumps? Sure. But um, I don't know if you want to walk through like a, a cluster upgrade or anything like that at all, uh, Josh. I unfortunately bootstrapped this cluster on one two one, So I don't know if I can do an upgrade without going through the process of making a new cluster, which could take 10 to 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I should have thought ahead on that. That would have been very smart. But um, as you all could imagine, um, using well, you know, what? We'll, we'll we'll play pretend for a moment. How's that sound? So uh, if I go and share my terminal, in theory, if I had thought ahead and and not released on this one, but actually released on an older version, I'd be able to go inside of here and actually um, one figure out what available upgrades there are, which is pretty cool. So Tanzu Kubernetes release available upgrades get, um, and it doesn't want the cluster name. Oh, it wants a TKR name. I wonder if this will work. I haven't actually used available upgrades before. Okay, cool. So like, basically what I can do here is I could say, okay, for this TKR, V1208, what TKRs can I upgrade to, right? As like a next step. And 1212 would be an example of that. Let's grab um, the other TKR. KR, where was that at, Josh? There we go, 119.12. And let's do this so I can see what the available upgrades are for this. Uh, and you can see here that it kind of has the, the step approach, right? So if you're on 119, your, your next upgrade path would be V128. Um, and then from V128, of course, as you saw up here, we could go to V121. And when the time is right, um, we can use Tanzu cluster upgrade here. This command to actually run the, the upgrade here, some examples of these, and you can see how we can point them at those TKRs. So if I was on 119, I'd point to that 128 TKR, run the upgrade. And those of you who are familiar with how cluster API upgrades nodes um, and you know switches the OS image out with a new node and all that jazz, um, that is the kind of cycle that you're gonna see happen here too. Sorry, I can't show it. I'm on the, I'm on the bleeding edge, unfortunately. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that's kind of highlighted in here is like everything is, is we have like this immutable chain going all the way down, right? And it, declarative immutable chain and sort of like there's a, there's a quality to that or a certain set of attributes that are very interesting or unique and reproducible, right? Um, and I do know that like there are some imperative goo we currently have inside the CLI, but we're fixing all of that right now. Um, that once you get to that full model of being able to have sort of a GitOps workflow through things, it's super powerful, right? Um, now you're going to get into some things where you still need to back them up. You're, there's no way to avoid some of that because, you know, but the ability, the ability to basically have a sort of forward facing, I'm going to commit something to a Git repo and all of a sudden, boom, my infrastructure's up. That's just, that's great. It simplifies everybody's life. And to hit on uh, Suleiman's question, uh, do I need vSphere for Tanzu? Uh, and you asked if it works with Workstation or Fusion. So kind of going back to what we talked about before, um, definitely don't need vSphere, although vSphere is a provider that we point to. Um, the provider under the hood talks into vCenter. So it would be a you know, vCenter-based deployment. Um, but if you downloaded it today, you could put it on an alternative cloud provider, uh, AWS, Azure. And if you just didn't want to pay people money, you could run it on your local machine using Docker, which would just create this whole model locally. It would absolutely not be a model you'd run in production, but it would be something that you could simulate a lot of the things Tim and I are showing you right now. Like if you were like, oh, I'd really like to see that cluster upgrade work, you could set up a Docker cluster right now and, and try that out. So. Cool. Um, the only other thing I can think of, Tim, that we haven't, we've alluded to, but maybe haven't talked much about, should we talk about like 
the plugin uh, specific to the CLI, the CLI plugin architecture. Yeah, well, we can. I don't know if you're doing a bleeding edge build or not, but like the bleeding edge build should have the notion of a, a CLI plugins two parts. Um, we're we're not all there there with the plugins being packages, but we're trying to get there fast. Yeah. Um, so ideally, you have a package which and an, an API around it. But one of the interesting things we're trying to do with the plugins. Uh, is the plugins can tie through the login workflow. So say, for example, I've got multiple versions of clusters and their dev stage and prod are different versions. And when I log in, I want to be able to know uh, what plugins are accessible for that environment. Because if I'm, I'm running an older version in prod, it's going to have to go through an API and check to see what capabilities are there. So one of the things we're building with the the CLI is the notion of context awareness. So if I do, you know, a login and I work a login workflow for a multi-cluster environment, um, that login workflow should then pull down and set the context locally. So that way I have access to the rec correct plugins. Now, ideally they're all packages, they're all containers, they all have comps. And that's just a really clean, simple model. That's where we're getting towards. That's we're, yeah. we're very close to that. And in and in kind of today's state, for those who have not dug into kind of what's going on here, like like Tim was saying, these commands, let's call them right. Tanzu cluster, Tanzu conformance, Tanzu. I am running a very bleeding edge thing here. Management cluster. Some of these commands are like things we're developing right now. Um, anywho, mm -hmm. uh, these just look like CLI commands, right? So when Tim's alluding to like this idea of like there could be packages and you could contextually see in a cluster which plugins and commands should be available to you. What kind of powers this under the hood if you're interested is effectively separate binaries, um, which is a really cool concept for those of you who might be thinking about like running these clusters, but extending the interaction with them and functionality. So what am I getting at? Obviously there is a command called Tanzu, but how it kind of works under the hood is when you call Tanzu cluster, it's actually going in and calling a binary that is completely built for cluster functionality. Um, so like as an example, and this is in like our architecture docs, but just to get into the nitty gritty, if we go into um, uh, local share uh, Tanzu CLI, when you do an install with your package manager, it is going to, in, in the CLI it in, initializes, it's actually going to bring down these binaries. So from a user perspective, um, you feel like you have this singular cohesive CLI, but what's really slick about this is you can go in and build your own plugin, your own binary. Those of you familiar with Go, this is all powered through Cobra. You produce that binary, you wire it up, and then that command will just show up in your CLI. Um, so imagine there's like some specific thing you want to shell out to all your developers so that they can like introspect something about their cluster. That's like really specific to your use case. I don't know. I'm just making this up. You have that extensibility point, um, that you can provide that. Um, and then it, like Tim was talking about with context awareness, there's like all these cool things coming where like the developer won't even have to worry about the binary. They'll just like log into a cluster and the CLI will just know that that functionality should be made available to them. So there's there's a lot of cool stuff in, in this architecture. But uh, in summary, what I'm getting at is when you're running these Tanzu commands, they're actually separate binaries under the hood. And that's what makes it highly, highly, highly extensible. Yep. And so like the current model, you know, those are actually binaries. But like the way we're moving it towards is like their packages. So if a person wants to publish a new plugin, they can just bind it up to a new repo. Right. And so very similar to how we install the package, there's no reason why the plugins themselves can't be sort of pluggable aspects of a, uh, you know, an actual Docker or an OCI image itself that's just run locally. So it's customization, customization galore. Like you can have a field day with this. So, you know, it, there's a lot of power, but there's also like, it can be kind of a foot gun. Uh, but at the same time, that, that, that power, that inherent customization is not something you get from other distributions. Like you can't go in there and tweak to the nth degree to make my own distribution from a distribution. That's not really easy to do. 
right? Uh, but we're trying to build out the apparatus so that way, like, I am an ISV ecosystem person running wherever, and I want to build my set of tools around it because I have, I I'm a redistribution partner or whatnot. I can go and do that, right? And that's an inherently different thing. It's, it's really powerful. Kubernetes itself is a platform platform, but most other distributions are not a platform platform. Nick wants to know if a foot gun is only for shooting your foot. <laughs> could be. You could also take out a leg. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we have any unanswered questions, Tim. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about architecturally? No, I think just kick the tires. You know, find out what works and does doesn't work. You know, um, you know, it's open source, it's available for everyone. Uh, see if it works for you. And if you like it, you know, if you don't like it, give us feedback, you know, um, always, as always like patches welcome. If you want to customize or change something, change something like, you know, we'll happily, happily take patches. Yeah. And maybe before I forget, <laughs> we should totally mention that there's a website. Yeah. Uh, I will put it in chat. This is our docs page. Like Tim said, and I probably should have led with, this is an open source Apache 2.0 project. So if you go to github.com, you go to VMware Tanzu, you type in community edition. This is the GitHub page containing the project um, that you were seeing a lot of. There's there's another sub project, or not sub project, but a, a project that feeds a lot of this called Tanzu Framework. So those of you who dig really deep, you'll you'll find some of that too. But to Tim's point, it's here, it's available, it's buildable from source. And if you do go through our docs and just want to kind of get started, we do have instructions for installing via Homebrew and Chocolatey. So to reiterate what Tim said, kick the tires. Let us know what you think. Um, we're also in Kubernetes Slack at tonzu-community-edition. Um, we try our best to be as responsive as possible. So please feel free to do the normal, anything from hitting us up in Slack to filing issues in GitHub. We would we would love to hear from you. Um, Nick said that's super rad. Thanks so much, Nick. And thanks for joining us today. Soli had one more question too, uh, Tim. Uh, resource consumption. Um, I think, but he's asking specifically about like, can it do edge cases like low resource utilization? I, I'm trying to parse that question. Uh... What about resource consumption? So be, is it because of the deployment model that you're talking about? Like if I'm, if I have a management cluster and workload clusters, I, I'm trying to parse that. Um, so, uh, and there's a question about downgrades. Um, so I'll, I'll do the first one. So if I'm interpreting the question about uh, edge use cases uh, or, and about resource consumption, you would probably still have a central control plane with many edge devices. So like one of the powers of cluster API and you know the model that we're building with Tanzu is that you're gonna have some central plane that you want to manage all of these little federated devices. And it's totally possible to provision a separate TKR specifically tailored for that environment. In fact, we're doing some of that work right now. So if I wanna do a very micro distribution that basically runs on these other environments, or if I want to be able to like bootstrap into these really small environments, um, you should be able to build a custom TKR specifically for that. Or if you had some re highly regulated environment, you could have a TKR for that too. But that's like, you know, um, once you get into those those user stories or scenarios, you 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 have all the power and flexibility to get that. Um, but you still you're still going to have to like manage it like any other Kubernetes cluster, right? Um, so hopefully that made sense and hopefully that answered your question. I'm trying to beautiful mind what I read there. <laughs> uh, uh, there was a question about downgrades. Um, so if you're trying to downgrade environment, the way I've always viewed this within Kubernetes because resource conversion on the API server never happens backwards, like not without you being super smart and writing a tool to do it. Um, I always recommend using Valero. There used to be a, a t-shirt that somebody made that said, Valero saved my bacon, right? And so doing a snapshot before you do a major event is always a good thing to do. Uh, and if you have sort of immutable infrastructure and you're doing blue-green style things, um, you know, on the commit, you can still sort of parcel out 
to do and have a backup on that, right? So there's, I always recommend backing up before you do a major life cycle operation for a whole environment because you just never know what can happen. Like I've seen so much, I've been around this community for you know, 2014 and I've seen everything I've, I thought would be impossible to see or people to use the tools in impossible ways, but I've seen it so far. So nothing, nothing surprises me anymore. I say that, but it always gets surprised by how, how many different ways things can break or, or go sideways. Okay. Well, on Tim and I's behalf, uh, thank you all so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure to show this thing off and talk to you all about it. Yeah, thanks. And if you have any questions, like feel free to hit us up on uh, Slack uh, and you know, feel free to submit issues on, on GitHub. Awesome. Have a great weekend, everybody. And hopefully we'll catch some of you next Friday. Have a great weekend. Later.